So Belinda Hackney, and I'll, I'll get you to start loading up your screen, Belinda, um, just while I introduce you. So our, our second topic is about maximising legume nitrogen contribution into the pasture. Um, Belinda is with uh, DPI in um, New South Wales, and Belinda's done heaps of projects on looking at the uh, effects of uh, nodulation in pastures to give us an indication of, of what might be happening with our, our nitrogen and many other um, projects. So I thought Belinda was a really good candidate to talk to us about um, how we can improve um, our nitrogen from our legumes and, and what might be stopping our legumes from um, fixing nitrogen. So thanks very much, Belinda, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, looks like we've got uh, the options of the PowerPoint or the video this morning, so we'll go with the PowerPoint. Um, so I'll just get started on this. Um, so Lisa's given a pretty good introduction um, to my talk. Uh, and I, a lot of my talk just based, is based around this kind of thing. And, you know, we think we put a legume in the past year, we've inoculated it. Um, and we think, you know, that, that it's going to um, fix nitrogen pretty well. And that's, you know, some of the time that happens, a lot of the time it doesn't. Uh, and so today I just wanted to run through um, some of the things that may go wrong um, and some of the things that are within our control, others are beyond our control, uh, and how we may be able to improve um, legume function and nitrogen fixation in pastures. So in terms of when the nitrogen fixed by legumes is available, um, assuming that they do nodulate well and they do fix well, you get a little bit of leakage during the growing season, not a lot. Um, there's some really interesting work being done just recently on measuring that, but it's, you know, it's still a small player in the scheme of things. So most of the benefit comes in the, you know, in the years um, after uh, the nitrogen has been fixed. So basically in any one year when you've got a legume growing, whatever nitrogen it fix, fixes, about 60% of that will be available in the next growing season. Of the remaining 40%, somewhere around 20 to 30% of that will be available in the second year and the last little bit of that in the third year. And, and bearing in mind that in um, permanent pastures, you've sort of got this you know, build up and reduction in nitrogen um, because of the pulses in demand of your other um, component species. But just looking at it in isolation, if you think about what's gonna be fixed this year, about 60% of that will be available um, next year. So in many ways, it's it's a slow release form of nitrogen fertilizer, and providing there's something um, there to take that nitrogen up, it can be a pretty um, robust kind of system, providing everything works well. So, if we go back to the assumption, um, it's a lot of research work has shown when things are working well, it's somewhere around 20 to 30 kilos of nitrogen fixed per tonne of above ground biomass that the, the legume produces. But there are many things that can impact it. So you can have anywhere from nothing um, to, you know, up to 40 kilos, sometimes 45 kilos of nitrogen um, per hectare of biomass in a, in a really good system. But we tend to have a lot more on the um, deficit side of, of that 20 to 30 kilos than what we do above it. So things that um, can impact that or impact achieving that kind of level of nitrogen fixation, things like soil acidity, um, nutrients, uh, herbicide impacts, herbicides applied within the growing season, but also herbicides that have been applied previously. And then other management factors too, including Know, what legume you've chosen to grow there, how you're managing it, um, seasonal conditions impacting on that and those sorts of things. So I'll just briefly run through, some of you may have seen this before, this was some survey work that we did probably six or seven years ago now. Um, there was um, a, whole, a whole bunch of paddocks that we looked at in terms of um, what was going on with nodulation, what was happening, uh, in terms of, um, of, of other factors that were impacting how they were, were nodulating. So this is, a, this is a, um, a, a component of some of those surveys. We're up over 300 paddocks now. So 
some of the results that come through from here on in, we'll talk about all of the paddocks. Some of them were subsequent to this um, original survey. So one of the things that we looked at was straight out legume content within these pastures and bearing in mind we went from so central tablelands and Monero districts in New South Wales are pretty much um, permanent pasture type zones. So within those you can see there's a huge range in um, the amount of legume that we found in those pastures so from very very low levels up to you know, nearly 70 percent. Then in the central western riverina and particularly in the central west we're looking at a lot of paddocks that are used for um, cropping in there and again big ranges um the riverina was a you know a bit of a mix of um the eastern parts of the riverina you tend to get into permanent pasture areas the western parts are cropping so those two more mixed farming zone areas tended to have a higher average level of legumes um, within their pastures but also still had a big range so that's um, just something to, to keep in mind um, there as well. Now, in terms of what you need um, for nodulation, um, basically you need 20 to 40 um, small pink nodules or three or four large pink nodules. So when we talk small, we're talking nodules that are less than five mils, big ones obviously bigger than five mils. So some combination of that is considered adequate. So this is a um, scoring system that Ron Yates developed. So pretty much that's what you want to be looking at. Now, in terms of when you look at that, it's pretty much um, somewhere around, um, you know, eight to 12 weeks after germination. Um, excuse me, I've just got a dog scratching at the door. I'll just let him in. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so you want to be looking at that um, sort of eight to 12 weeks after germination. If you go too early, um, you may not um, pick them up. Uh, and if you go too late, you can get into a situation where they're actually starting to drop nodules off if they're getting you know, close towards the end of their growing cycle. Um, so in terms of what we saw with these pastures, um, if you take that score of four, which is on the bottom axis there, 93% of the, of the paddocks that we have sampled since 2015 um, had inadequate nodulation. So, um, you know, if you, if you don't have enough nodules on there, then their capacity for achieving those nitrogen fixation targets are um, really drastically reduced. And we saw more than 20% of paddocks in some regions that had no nodules at all. So if you're in a situation where you have no nodules, then there's no capacity for nitrogen fixation. And those legumes are going to be using nitrogen from the soil pool rather than contributing to it. Um, so you can actually be in a net deficit situation there if your exports are large and you, you know, you're not getting um, a contained sort of cycling program. Um, so uh, some of the things that we looked at to try and explain what was happening um, there, uh, there's a lot of emphasis, as Lisa said, put on soil phosphorus. So this is just the ratio of available P to critical P um, for just how we've, we've transformed that data uh, there on that little graph. And what we found with that was there were around 40% um, of paddocks that had um, available phosphorus uh, less than where you would like it to be. So, you know, it, it is an issue, but certainly there were more, um, a much higher proportion of paddocks where you were really in luxury phosphorus availability um, within that survey. So sulphur was um, uh, something else we had a look at. What we found there was sulphur deficiency was much more prevalent. So we had almost three quarters of paddocks that were below um, that eight milligrams per kilogram of sulfur. Now a lot of the time with sulfur people will say well it moves um, you know it moves into the subsoil it's mobile and it is but we've went down um, in some of our subsequent surveys to 60 centimetres looking for sulfur and we haven't found it. So the thing is that if you you know if a legume has to grow to that depth or deeper to find sulfur um, it's growing uh, in a situation where it's deficient for quite a long period till the roots get down there. But what we're tending to find anyway is that it's, it's not beyond that zone in the areas that we're working in. And a big reason for that is the type of fertilisers that are being used. So there's a high prevalence of MAP and DAP use, even in the permanent pasture areas with um, 
with sowing of new pastures and even in some cases with uh, top dressing of pastures. And of course, they contain little to no sulphur. Uh, and so if you can't, you know, if, you, if you're not putting it on, well, it's not there. Uh, so the, the plant can't access it. And sulphur is a really important um, uh, element for you know building of proteins there's a lot of enzymes involved in plant growth there's enzymes nitrogenase particularly that's involved in nitrogen fixation uh, and that's the little um, graphic you can see on the left of that slide and you can see that sulfur is an integral part of the structure of that enzyme and if you can't uh, if the if the rhizobia can't access um, sulfur and they access it through the plant and so if the plant can't access it then you can't build nitrogenase and you can't fix nitrogen. Now moving on to um, soil mineral N levels. So if you do have high levels of mineral nitrogen available and that's actually a negative feedback on, um, on the capacity of those legumes to fix nitrogen or the willingness of them to do it. Because uh, just like humans, if you can get nitrogen for free, then they'll choose to do that rather than fix it because it costs a lot of energy for a plant to fix nitrogen. Now, it's really hard to try and pin down rhizobiologists in terms of what level of nitrogen is likely to cause some feedback, but we did get some agreement that once you get above 40 milligrams of mineral N per kilogram, um, you'll start to have some feedback on it. And certainly once you get to 100 milligrams, you'll have quite significant feedback on it. So within the survey work that we did, we had more than 80% of paddocks that were below that threshold. So it's very unlikely that high nitrogen levels were something that were impeding the capacity of those legumes to nodulate and fix nitrogen. So if we move on to soil pH, and this comes back um, also to one of the things Lisa asked me to talk about, which was plant suitability. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with looking at um, where plants are comfortable in terms of their pH range, so this is pH in calcium chloride, uh, and basically where it's green um, within this little chart, those plants will grow quite happily. Where it's yellow, there's some restriction to their growth, and where it's red, there'll be very significant restriction to their growth and performance. So if we look at something like subclover, Basically, when you're at a pH of 4.8 or above, that plant will be pretty happy and it'll grow quite well. Lucens and annual medics, the plant's quite happy at pH of 5. Then you get into the more acid tolerant things like Vicerula and Cerradella that'll go down to you know, 4 and that kind of thing. But the thing that we often forget is um, the rhizobia that's associated with those legumes and what kind of pH they need for optimal performance. So if we look at the subclover again, so the plant was happy down to a pH of around about 4.8, but the rhizobia, um, which will buy as group C um, rhizobia uh, or group C inoculant, um, it needs a pH of five and a half or above to perform optimally. So you've got that disparity between where the legume will grow and grow reasonably well um, and where the rhizobia can function optimally. Now that gap between it there's an increasing reliance of the plant then on using nitrogen from the soil pool to um, fulfill its needs. If you look at something like lucin um, and the annual medic, that disparity is even greater. So the plants will grow quite well down to a pH of around about five, but for optimal performance of the rhizobia, you need a pH of seven or above. Um, so that's you know, a, a huge disparity with lucins and annual medics in terms of their performance. As I said, like the Bicer rulers and the Cerradellas, they give you um, some degree of flexibility in terms of the pHs that they will tolerate and also what their rhizobia um, can, can comfortably function at. Uh, but still, even with those, there's still a disparity um, between you know, where the plant will grow well but be utilising a lot of nitrogen compared to where you get alignment between the plant doing well and the rhizobia being able to perform optimally. So in our surveys, if we look at the group C plant hosts, which are basically your annual clovers, the pHs that we saw there in those paddocks, um, about 70 or nearly 80% of those were below a pH of 5.5. So they're below the level where that rhizobia can actually function um, well. And if we look at lucin, 
an annual MADIC, so covering that AL and AM inoculant group, basically all the paddocks that we've surveyed um, are below that level. So their capacity to reach those nitrogen fixation targets are severely limited by the soils that we're growing them in. So if you think about all those things, all of those different um, characteristics that we've looked at, and combine them together and think, well, what are the main things that are driving um, the capacity of these things to nodulate? Uh, this looks like a bit of a horror show, but it's fairly easy to work your way through. So what we found with our work was uh, when you put all of this stuff into a regression tree analysis, um, it sensibly split on the basis of the host plants. So um, all of the lucens and annual medics got shoved over to one side. They had a very low nodulation score in our um, survey work, which is not surprising given the misalignment, particularly with soil pH for those. So there's not a lot more you can do with that when you've got you know, a low number of paddocks that we surveyed there that had them in and they all scored very, um, very poorly. So there's no real point in pulling that apart any further. But if we go over to the right hand side of this tree, so the subclover, the bicerula, and the few vetch paddocks that we came across um, formed the majority of the, of the um, paddocks that we, we've looked at. And the first split for those came on the um, basis of available phosphorus. So the ratio of available to critical phosphorus and where your phosphorus levels were low, so you know, less than 70% of what was deemed critical, um, it pulled out some paddocks there and, and took them off to the side. So 41 paddocks there that had a nodule score of about 1.7. So they're inadequately nodulated. On the other side, where available to critical phosphorus was above that level, that's where the bulk of our paddocks sat. Now, again, um, analysis pulled them apart on the basis of the host plants. So where we had the bicerula and veg paddocks, there weren't many paddocks of those but they tended to be very well nodulated. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So they were above the adequate nodulation level. The bulk of the paddocks that we're looking, about, looking at here were subclover. Um, and the thing that really separated those in terms of whether they were poorly or well nodulated was on the basis of soil pH. So fundamentally, if you had paddocks um, that had a pH of above 5.5, uh, and this is not playing with the data at all, this is just how it, how it flopped out of the analysis. If it was above pH of 5.5, then your average nodule score was 3.95, which is close enough to four. So it's very close to being adequate. But the bulk of the paddocks were below that level. And so they were quite poorly nodulated. So it was a very clear cut kind of picture. Um, that aligns really well with the, you know, the chart that I showed you before with the um, plant tolerance and the rhizobia tolerance. If your pH is right, then those paddocks tend to um, be able to perform well. Now, just a note on those uh, bicerula and vetch paddocks. Um, it's not just a simple case of, uh, you know, you grow bicerula and vetch and everything will be rosy. When we went back and looked at the characteristics of those paddocks, the pH, the phosphorus, the sulfur levels, the soil physical conditions of those paddocks, so um, you know the, the soil texture, the drainage, those sorts of things were all really suitable for, for those species that were growing there. And particularly in the case of Bicerula being a new species, one thing that people tend to do well when they're growing something new is follow the fundamental principles a little bit better in terms of where they put that. So really that's just a case in point of if you get all your ducks in a row, um, your ducks get a better chance at, at doing what they need to do. Um, okay, so moving on here to then how you might be able to improve things in terms of um, you know, legume nodulation and performance. This is some work that was done in the late 80s and just looking at what happens if you change pH. pH was such a driver of what we were seeing in terms of whether things were well nodulated or whether they were inadequately nodulated. So this is looking on the y-axis at the number of nodules uh, on the root system uh, and what you can see there in the unlimed, um, the, the unlimed bar is that you're looking at somewhere around about um, you know, 500 nodules per root 
So I'd have to have a look again at this data and see what depth they were going to, to do that. But that's at a pH of around about 4.1, 4.2. Um, same paddock than if they you know, split this or within this trial had different lime rates. But if they took that to a pH of somewhere between five and a half and six, you get a significant increase in the number of nodules. So this is without doing anything in terms of without um, adding more inoculant or doing anything like that, that simply changing soil pH um, leads to a significant increase in, in the number of nodules. Um, this is just some more work that was done by Murray Ankovic um, in the mid 90s. So within your legume plants, um, you can determine what percentage of nitrogen has been derived from the atmosphere. So what proportion of nitrogen in that plant has, has come from nitrogen fixation. So again here, looking at the top left graph, where, we, where you've got a pH of 4.8, it's around about 45% of nitrogen in those legume plants was derived from the atmosphere. If you increase the pH in this case to just over five, that went up to about 75%. So the reliance on, or, or the potential of those legumes to thieve nitrogen from the soil pool is greatly reduced just by increasing soil pH and allowing those plants to form an effective symbiosis and fix their own nitrogen. Another site um, that was in that study, they took it from a pH of 4.6 to 5.6, and you can see a similar type of result there. So when you get to a pH of 5.6, you're starting to approach 90% of, um, of nitrogen found in that plant has been derived from the atmosphere. Now you never get it to 100%, because it takes a little bit of time um, for those nodules to form after the plant germinates and emerges. So there's a bit of a delay there. You'll never get it to 100%, but if you're approaching 90%, that's pretty good. Okay, so some of the things that can interrupt or other things that can interrupt um, herbicides uh, can, can be um, something that are impactful on nodulation. And that can either be herbicides that have been previously applied uh, or herbicides that are applied within the growing year. So this particular photo um, is of some subclover where uh, a sulfonyl urea, so a group B herbicide, was applied in the year prior to these legumes being grown. Now, what you can see on the left is that was a rocky area within the paddock where um, it wasn't able to be sprayed or the boom spray didn't get to. And on the right hand side is um, the treated area of the paddock. And what you can see there is the, on that plant on the right hand side is that you've got a stripping of the upper um, lateral roots. And so you've got no roots there and very little nodulation. So what that means is that that plant root has had to grow below that affected zone um, and then develop its laterals out there, which takes more time to do which means there's a longer period of time where it's actually drawing nitrogen from the soil pool. So that means that over the life of that plant, it fixes less nitrogen. Now it's also puts it in a more, um, a more stressful situation in terms of being able to obtain nutrients and obtain the moisture it needs to grow well. And you can contrast that with the plant on the left where it hasn't had that um, residue problem. Now I should say with this, the, the farmer observed all of the um, plant back periods um, that applied to this fertilizer, uh, this fertilizer, this herbicide. Um, so there'd been, you know, sufficient time passed, sufficient rain received. Um, they were cognizant of the pH effects on on herbicide breakdown uh, and that kind of thing. So there was nothing um, wrong done here, but it's just that these things can hang around sometimes. This is another example. So this was some work done by Ron Yates um, when he was at DAFWA, uh, looking at the effects of, again, this is um, trisulfuron, so another sulfonyl urea. Uh, and if we look at the right-hand side, these are subclover plants that are 18 days old. Um, and when we start on the right-hand side, you can see they're at 18 days old, the nodules that are formed around the crown of that plant where there's been no um, residue. Now, as you move further to the left, the levels of residue become much higher. And even where you've got one one hundred thousandth 
of the initial um, application rate, which is the one um, second from the right, the plant itself looks pretty good, looks about the same size. The root systems look pretty good, but what you can see is there are no nodules on that root system, even at one one hundred thousandth of the um, initial dose. And as you move further to the right, the damage becomes more severe. Um, you can see reddening of those plants, um, the laterals disappear, there's no nodules. Uh, so that plant becomes you know, more prone to other stresses. And it's also the only way it can source nitrogen is from the soil pool. This is just another example. This is some work that we did um, in the last couple of years, looking at uh, a range of different herbicides that were applied in wheat the year prior to growing, in this case, pulses. Uh, and you can see the kind of above and below ground damage that you've got there on those plants. And that's, that's around um, 10 weeks after sowing. And within all of those two, you've had observation of the um, plant back periods for each of those herbicides. So in terms of inoculation, um, it's another thing, you know, this is a, getting your inoculation right when you sow a new pasture is a, it's like vaccinating your lambs or your calves. It's just something that you do um, and something that should be done because uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a low hanging fruit in terms of ways that can increase the, the capacity of those plants to nodulate. So um, in terms of sowing new pastures, you want to inoculate as close to sowing as possible. Um, and that's particularly, particularly for those wet delivery systems. So peat or freeze dried um, systems, you want to inoculate as, as close to sowing as possible. So preferably within 12 hours. Um, and I'll show you some data in a minute on that. And remember that the wet delivery systems do, they deliver super high numbers um, or have the potential to deliver really high numbers of rhizobia to the soil, but they require good moisture um, for those rhizobia to survive because it's quite, they're quite prone to desiccation. So in more recent years, there's been some low moisture granules um, developed. Uh, they have lower numbers of rhizobia within them, but they tend to be more stable and they can be useful things if, if soil moisture is marginal or if you anticipate it's going to be um, you know, a while between when you sow and when you get germinating rain. So we use those um, frequently when we're doing summer sowing and those sorts of things with our hard seeded legumes. The thing you've got to remember with those though is that they, do, they are um, considerably more costly. In terms of established pastures, I get a lot of questions, uh, people who have dug up their pastures and find that they've got poor nodulation. And, and the first thing that they tend to want to do is to re-inoculate that pasture. Um, and I always say to them, like, the thing you've got to do before you attempt to do that is identify what the cause was. So, you know, this little point, if, if um, there's other factors bigger than lack of rhizobia number that are causing poor nodulation. So, you know, say for example, if your pH is extremely low, um, you may be able to inoculate and get an increase in, in nodulation um, in the subsequent year uh, with that, but you're soon gonna find yourself back in the same situation again. So you have to start to think about what's actually causing the symptoms that you see. Now, the last point there might sound really obvious, but it happens more often than you think. So regardless of whether it's a new pasture or whether you are in the situation where you're looking at a top up, make sure you use the right inoculant group for the legume species that you're targeting. Um, it, it seems like a simple thing, but often that can get um, messed up. So in terms of inoculation, I just wanted to show you this um, around the importance of getting um, high rhizobia numbers to um, to the soil. And so this was some work done at Tamworth um, a few years ago now, uh, and it's looking at what happens with peat inoculant from the time you open the bag to when you get it in the ground. And this is under a good system where it happens within 24 hours. So if we look at the far right column, that's the number of, um, or the percentage, look at the percentage numbers there of seed that's, of, or, rhizobia that's surviving on the seed. So you open the bag and basically no time has elapsed. So you open the bag, you've got 100% of what you start with. That's good. Now they're 
coated these onto lupins in this case uh, and augured them into the truck. And already they've lost 90% of the rhizobia that they started with. Now that's normal. That's like, you know, that's, you've still got very high numbers there, but that's how quickly these things die. They drive into the paddock, um, they get them into the, into the cedar and you've lost 99%, so you're back to 0.8% of what you started with. You plant them within five hours and you've lost 99.5% of them. And then you recover them from, they recovered these from the soil uh, about 23 hours later and they were down to 0.1% of what they started with. Now, on a big seed, that's still enough that 1,000, you know, a bit over 1,000 um, cells on the seed is still enough. But that just tells you how quickly that happens. So that's why, ideally, if you can inoculate within 12 hours of sowing, um, if you're using these wet delivery systems, that gives you a better chance of achieving a good, um, a good nodulation with those. And certainly you don't want to be doing it a week ahead or something like that, or putting it up against the western wall in the shed or something, you know, like that. So just something to think about there. It's um, something that can be quite simple in terms of the thing that you can manipulate to give you a better chance of success. Um, the last thing I want to talk about there is just seed treatments too. So possibly less of an issue on pasture seeds than it is on pulses. This was some work that we did with pea pickle tea. Um, now we had a range of different rhizobia strains. This was for um, peas, uh, lentils and vetch. So don't worry too much about that. The group of bars on the left hand side is where we had no pea pickle tea on the seed and you've got the nodulation score up the side. So you can see there the nils, of course, you're not going to have anything with that. We didn't have any rhizobia on the, on the um, seed that we sowed. So they were just as controls. But what you can see with those others is that you're up around threes and fours with those different um, strains there for those particular things we were looking at with without the use of pea pickle tea. You go across to that centre graph and that's had um, a, a 12 hour exposure to pea pickle tea um, and that's still pretty good okay so you're still getting um, pretty good results in terms of nodulation. If you go over to the group of bars on the right hand side that's had 24 hours of exposure between the rhizobia and the treated seed and you can see a significant reduction in um, in uh, you know the, the nodulation that you've achieved so really what you've got to think about with this is often a tendency to mix a lot of things with seed at sowing um, and you just need to be careful of that so anytime you can separate it um, that's a good thing uh, if you can't then you just got to try and minimize the exposure time of some of the some of the other additives that may go on to seed if you can all right, so I think our conclusions are really that a lot of the time in terms of we, we dig up these plants, they've got poor nodulation and we think, oh, it's not very good. But then when you actually look at the conditions that they're growing in, um, you know, we really are expecting optimal performance in suboptimal conditions. Um, and a lot of the research that's been done, it considers one constraint at a time. So there'll be cases where, you know, they say, oh, you get a, you'll get a massive increase in nodulation if you put more phosphorus on, for example, or something. But then you look at the paper and they've done, everything else is okay in that. So they've had adequate levels of all the other nutrients. Your soil pH is good. The plots have been watered. The only limiting factor is P. And in that case, of course, you'll probably get a response to it. But the thing is, in our paddocks in commercial settings, a lot of the time they're facing this kind of you know, storm of non-ideal events simultaneously. And so there's a lot of stresses that are applied on these plants. So, you know, you've just got to look for the big things. And if there's more than a couple of them, then you're going to be putting those plants and that rhizobia under a lot of pressure. Um, and remember that the nodules are just the canary in the mine shaft. So it's not all about nodulation, but that's just an indicator. So, um, and what we're tending to see is there's just been this deviation from some of the fundamentals of growing legumes in terms of having them set up in the right pH, making sure you don't have herbicide, potential herbicide residue impacts and that sort of thing. And, and the bottom line is if the things aren't fixing nitrogen, then they're using it and they're a less efficient user of nitrogen than a grass. So really legumes without nodules are just a fancy looking bit of grass. So I'll stop there. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Belinda. That's um, 
Um, yeah, really good coverage of all the things that we need to get right in our systems, um, right down from just the clover to the inoculation part. So that was really well done. Thank you. Thank you.